We are uh, going to start a new sermon series for the next uh, few weeks, and it is called Now It's Personal. And you know that when you are in a, a situation with someone, or when you are in a conflict with someone, or when you are in a relationship with someone, this is a phrase that changes the tenor of the conversation. If two uh, prize fighters just want to find out who the best is, you know, that doesn't make for good TV. But when somebody says something about somebody else that doesn't rub them the right way and they make it personal, that's interesting, right? So now it's personal kind of changes it to a different uh, degree. This sermon series, I have a, a thinly veiled agenda. In fact, the, the, the agenda is so thinly veiled, I'm going to tell you exactly what it is. I'm going to tell you my expectation and my agenda with, with presenting this to you for the next few weeks. So it's not thinly veiled at all. It's not veiled at all. Some people will, will do something and they have a hidden agenda. I'm going to tell you what my agenda is eventually. Uh, but first I want to talk about three groups of people. There are three groups of people represented in this church uh, today and throughout this community. Uh, and the three groups of people are this. First and foremost, there is the group uh, not a Christian. Now, uh, you know, we're, we're all good Christian folks, I'm sure, uh, but the reality is, in a church this size, across three services, there are people that, that just have not made a commitment to follow Jesus Christ. We understand that there are people that are not Christians, uh, for a myriad of reasons, and they still come to church. They come to church because, you know, it's just easy. Their wife will leave them alone if they come to church. You know, they, they come to church because they bring their, their kids, they don't want their kids to be heathen, so they bring them to Sunday school, so they sit through church, or... Or they recognize that the church has, you know, a, a, a positive impact on the community. It's a place of positivity. But they're just, they're not Christians. They have not made that commitment. And that is one group of people. The second group of people would be Christians. This is people that we understand have made a commitment to follow Jesus Christ. They, you know, ABC, just like we're taught in school. They accept that Jesus died for their sins and rose from the dead. They believe in Christ. And they are Christians. And, and these two groups, we, we kind of want to put everybody in the middle group and nobody on the left, but a recent study shows that Anne Arundel County has upwards of 60% of its residents that identify as non-religious. Okay, so that, that's a staggering number about our community, not, not, not Baltimore, not the United States, or, or, or Zimbabwe, right here, back door, 60% non-religious. Uh, the third group of people... Uh, is we're going to call the all-in category. Now, if you've been in some of our Bible studies recently, we've used different language to describe this group of people. If you're in our men's study on Saturday mornings, uh, this might be what we've recently started calling a kingdom disciple. Uh, you may have been through a Bible study with us uh, a few months back or a year or so back where we did not a fan, where we talked about the difference between being a fan and being a follower of Jesus. Uh, we may call this being an ambassador for Christ. But this category of people, the all-in category, are not people that have just made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. And, and, and both of these two categories here, they're both going to heaven when they die. We're not talking about being gooder Christians or different levels of salvation. But these are folks that have allowed the Bible and have allowed Christ to influence every area of their life. They, they've let God, they take God to work with them, they take God to school with them. God dictates their, their decisions and through the power of the Holy Spirit dictates uh, their, their finances and their choices. And they just don't make decisions unless they meter it against the truth of God's word and the movement of the Holy Spirit. That's what being all in means. All right, so three groups of people. Here's my agenda, my thinly veiled, not covered up at all agenda. The agenda for this sermon series in particular, even though this is kind of our agenda all the time, is I want each and every person that walks through the doors over the next four weeks to cross one of those lines. Okay? And I actually, I want to do everything, say everything, convince, maybe that's the wrong word, woo, persuade, explain, whatever it is I need to explain to get every single person in this church to cross one of those lines. Now, some of you are saying, well, I'm all in, so I guess I'll, I'll see you in five weeks. I'll just I'll go somewhere else for a while, right? But there's an application here for you, too, because if you are all in, and I know there are people in this church that are all in that, you know, you, you, you prayed for three hours before you came to church this morning. Um, if you are all in, then every single day of your life at school, at work, in your family, in your relationships, you are dealing with these two other groups of people. 
Okay, so there is still application here for you if you are all in. But we want you to cross those lines. And let's face it, if you haven't crossed one of these lines, you have good reasons. We all have good reasons. I've actually written down some of the reasons. I rarely write down anything, but these are important, so I want to make sure I get them all in. If, if you haven't crossed that line, we all, we all have reasons. And, and your reason is not stupid. Okay, and your reason is not bad, and the, the whole purpose of this series is not to look at the reasons people don't, you know, give more, confess more, believe more, and, and negate all those reasons. Your reasons are not stupid, but first and foremost, we've talked about this before, uh, one of the reasons that people don't plug in deeper, or connect with church at all, or connect with Christ at all, has nothing to do with Jesus. Everybody loves Jesus, okay? Free food, nice guy, healed people, like, nobody hates Jesus, the reason that people don't plug in and connect and get involved with church or get involved on a deeper level with their faith is, is us, right? right? The, the Christians over time, you know, everybody can tell you about that one Christian, that one time, and that's the reason I just can't, I can't ever because of this one time. So it's other uh, Christians. So for some people, the reason they can't go a little deeper, maybe the reason that you come to church and you call yourself a Christian, but you just can't, you can't go in all the way is because of a previous uh, tradition or religion, faith background in your past, right? You know, it's okay if I come here, it's okay if, if, if I'm a Christian, but, you know, we were raised X, Y, Z, and as long as grandma's still alive, if she knew that, you know, I got, you know, baptized or joined the church or, you know, really, really took this seriously, I can't do that to grandma, right? Because grandma's a different faith, faith background or whatever. Um, some people uh, are just uh, agnostic. All right, we understand what that means, right? They understand that there's these three groups of people, and they would tell you they don't fit into any of them. Uh, they would say, look, I, I get it. I understand the process. I've read the Bible. Might be true, might not be true. It's just not that important, whether, whether it is or it isn't. Like, it's just, I'm at a level where it's like, I don't want to dispute what the Christians say, but the atheists, they seem really angry. So I'm just, I'm agnostic. I'm just, you know, it's not that important. Um, and then sometimes the obstacle to cross from one line to the next, is actually the Bible itself. All right, one of the things, if you follow me on social media, one of the things I put out this week, I asked people to share with me what the most extraordinary, unbelievable part of the Bible was for you. Right, and, and people shared all the, all the normal things. You know, this idea of uh, a there's a talking donkey in the Bible. All right, people are raised from the dead, not just Jesus. People are raised from the dead. Uh, the idea of a, a, a seven-day, 24-hour creation period. The idea of Jonah and the whale, a man living three days in a fish. Uh, even things like Noah's Ark. And just so many things in the Bible, and especially in, in this part of the country. Okay, we, we, are, we are immersed in a, in a pretty, <laughs> this is a compliment, so take this with you, pretty intelligent part of the country. You wouldn't think that if you ever drive on 100 at 5 o'clock, but it's a, pretty, <laughs> it's a pretty intelligent part of the country, right? And a lot of engineers, okay, a lot of logical thinkers, and, and you just can't get past some of the stuff, right? There's just stuff in the Bible that, like, look, I believe in Jesus, I believe he died for my sins, but, you know, there's just stuff in here that I've, I've learned too much. I cannot, I cannot grasp, grasp this. And, and so I actually did, did some research on my own because I had to ask smarter people than myself. When we have, whatever objection you have about the Bible, I've got a book for that. Okay, in fact, that's what, that's what pastors do. We accumulate books that deal with your objections. And they're all written by smarter people than me, I promise you. Um, some people get hung up, well, you know, the, the flood. The flood doesn't matter. Two, animals two by two, and there's actually two flood accounts. You know, sometimes animals are two by two. Sometimes it's this many unclean and, and that many uh, clean animals. So it's, it's just very confusing for people, and the entirety of the world was wiped out. And so I have this scholarly paper by someone very smarter than me, and uh, hundreds of thousands of these papers exist. Uh, evidence Noah's biblical flood happened says Robert Ballard, who is, a, who is a, not a biblical scholar, just a scholar. And if your hang-up about the Bible was, well, I just don't believe things like Noah's Ark, you could read this article, all right, it's, it's very well put together, you could read the hundreds of thousands just like it, and it'd be like, oh, well, I guess I believe the Bible now, right? Or, 
Uh, how could Jonah survive three days in the belly of a whale? This is a fascinating article. I read this, and now I believe Jonah's uh, story more than I believed it when I started. Like, this was just really put together. It's by a really smart guy, and there are hundreds of thousands of articles like this. And it's like, well, if you're hanging up with the Bible is, you know, a man can't survive three days in the belly of a whale or belly of a big fish or whatever it's translated, uh, you could read this and be like, well, I'm over my objection now, so I guess I believe the Bible. Or finally... Biblical reasons to believe that the creation days were 24-hour periods. You know, a lot of people are hung up on, you know, creation was a six-day, 24-hour period, and there's, there's uh, scientific evidence that kind of leans that direction versus a, you know, an earth that is billions and billions and billions of years old. But if you are a, a scientist or if you've been raised in, in biological fields or chemical fields, um, that just doesn't make sense to you, right? It just doesn't make sense because you've learned too much. So there's this really well-put-together article by someone smarter than me and biblical reasons to believe that creation days were 24-hour periods. And there are hundreds of thousands of these articles. So you read this article, and you, know, you no longer have any objections because I've just answered your objection. Now, the reality is you know that regardless of what Bible story we're talking about, and regardless of the scholarly points that I present to say, well, I know you have a problem with it, but, but this is why it's true, that those objections and satisfying those objections really isn't what it, it's about. I don't believe Jonah and the whale, or I don't believe this story, I don't believe that uh, an axe head floated in the water. Okay, for those of you who don't go to Sunday school, you may have never heard that story, but it's fascinating. All right? But it's not about satisfying objections, and I'll give you an example. Uh, many of you uh, men in here are married, all right? And many of you, if you would hearken back to a younger time and say, hey, what about getting married? You would say, I'm never getting married, or I don't want to get married. And you would have objections. You would have objections to marriage. And some of you ladies would have had this too, right? Objection, you know, I'm too young, too young to get married. Or I don't have enough money to get married, or specifically I don't have enough money for a wedding. Or, you know, I haven't met everyone, so how do I know she's the one, right? I had, I had a friend in college, no lie, he would not get married because he's like, just as soon as I pick a woman and as soon as I get married, my soulmate will be like the caterer at the wedding. You know, I'll like meet her at the reception, you know. And you don't want to give up your freedom, you know, and, and, and financially, you know, two can eat as cheap as one, as long as one doesn't eat. Like, it's a whole, you have to get over a myriad of problems in your mind, a myriad of, of objections. And the reality is, for most of us, for all of us that are married, those objections never went away. You just met someone. You just met someone, and it became the reason that you changed your mind. The reason that you decided that marriage was an option for you is what? Love. Love. You fell in love. And it didn't matter that you were too young. And it didn't matter that your checking account was overdrawn. And it didn't matter that you hadn't met every single person. That was the one. And marriage was no longer about a category of something that I've got to check off the boxes before I can do. Marriage was no longer uh, this thing where I have to satisfy all of my objections. Marriage was about a person. Marriage became personal. And any of you who have made that decision, you know that you did not get your, all of your objections satisfied. Many of you who made that decision may still have an overdrawn bank account. But it became about a person. And that's the reality when it comes to our faith, when we want to cross those lines that we were talking about earlier. For every objection you have, I have a book. For every argument you have and every reason that you can't plug in or church just doesn't feel right or mom told me this and church people say this, for every reason you have, I have a really good argument against it. And if I don't have a really good argument against it, I, I, there are people smarter than me. Uh, if you have a theological question, uh, there are people much smarter than me. And, and they can satisfy your objection, but it's not really about the objections. It's about making it personal. So what this series will address, and, and we're actually, we're going we're gonna to barely skim the surface, so we're not going to come to a resolution today, so that's just the tea. You, got, you have to come back next week because I'm not going to finish. Um, what, what we'll look at in this series is we are going to look at people throughout Scripture that didn't learn about things and didn't read about things, but they actually had a personal relationship or a personal interaction with the Lord and how that kind of changed their objections. These were people with objections. 
These were people that could say, look, there's a reason that I don't do X, Y, Z, and it's this. And so that's what we're going to look at because, like I said, I want each and every person to cross one of those lines. And if you've crossed every line, I want you to have the capacity and the wisdom and the understanding to deal with the 60% of Anne Arundel County who hasn't crossed any of those lines. All right, so turn with me, if you will, to John chapter 1. We're going to look at a a section of verses here. This is uh, Jesus is going around and uh, gathering up his disciples. This is when he's calling folks. All right, so he's he's started to kick up a little sand. He's he's basically at this point a a rabbi just gathering a following. And in John chapter one verse forty three says this: The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, "Follow me." All right, so, so Jesus is starting to, to call guys in, and Jesus just basically went around. I'm sure there was probably, you know, more to the conversations, or maybe he sat down with these guys, but he would say, follow me, follow me. Now, Philip was the exception, okay? Uh, there are not a lot of Philips in the church, and everybody wants to identify, as, oh, no, I'm a Philip, you're, you're probably not a Philip. But Philip was the exception because Jesus said, follow me. He didn't really ask many questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, you, you, you've got, I, I, you, it seems legit. You know, and some, for some people, uh, that's how faith is. That's how faith works for you. You, know, you heard the story of Jesus. You heard the story of, of what's been done for you. And it, the first time, it just made perfect sense. And that's what you committed to your life to. And you've committed your life to that ever since. There are, there are people like that. Um, I would argue that they're probably in the minority. But Philip was one of those people. Jesus said, follow me. And Philip said, sounds good. Sounds reasonable. I don't know why I wouldn't do that. In verse 44 it says, now Philip was from Bethesda, the city of Andrew and Peter. So they're just establishing some context here of where people are from. Philip found Nathanael and said to him. Now, uh, Philip, uh, Jesus normally was calling his disciples, but Philip was so excited. Philip was so enamored with what was going on with this Jesus guy that he was actually going and now, and now pulling in disciples. Like he was, he was crowdsourcing because he was so excited about what was going on. And Philip said to him, we have found of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Now, this is a huge deal. Okay, this is a huge deal because this was a Jewish community and these were Jewish people. And they had been waiting on their Messiah or their Christ or their light for years. Not weeks, not months, not years, but years, hundreds and hundreds of years. And if you've noticed, the space between uh, Malachi and Matthew's blank. Like, it had been a while. Like, God, the word of God had not, had not spoke, and they had been waiting for hundreds of years on the Messiah. Jewish people just waiting. And some of them actually had given up. If you look at, look at the ancient history at this time, a lot of Jewish folks had just given up that maybe this wasn't going to happen, or maybe it wasn't going to happen the way they thought it was. And so hundreds and hundreds of years, your mom waited, your grandma waited, your grandma's grandma waited, and then one of your friends comes up to you, and says, we found him. The one that we've been waiting for, the one our parents have been waiting for, the, the relief, the Savior, the light, the Messiah, I found him. And that, that, that's such a huge deal. We kind of gloss over that like, you know, these are just folks, you know, doing whatever. But this was a prophecy, and you're the person that thinks you've just found the link. So obviously he was telling a lot of people he was very excited about it. But then he, then he overplayed his hand. You ever overplay your hand? Where it's like you're trying to convince somebody of something and you, you just you either outpunt your coverage or you just you kind of you say too much. Like you should have backed up and stopped talking five minutes ago. A lot of pastors have that problem. Um, not me. Uh, so he, he overplays his hand because look, we found the one. We found the guy. We found the Messiah. We found the one that mom and grandma and grandma's grandma were waiting for. And he adds something. He says, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, Nathaniel is a bit skeptical. Nathaniel, I would say, represents the majority. Philip probably represents the minority. And we've, we've looked at this verse before because I think this is so kind of telling of the approach. Verse 46 says, Nathaniel said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? All right, now, now Nazareth was uh, understanding kind of the map at the time and the culture of the time. Nazareth was a hole in the wall. 
And we're not even exactly sure why, but Nazareth kind of had a bad reputation. It's never mentioned in a positive light in Scripture and ancient texts. This is Nazareth. You know, like, Nazareth would be, you know, when you, know when you, get, <laughs> when you get on the light rail uh, to go to the Orioles game, and you're comfortable where you get on the light rail, and you're comfortable where you get off at Camden Yards, but there's a few spots in between where you just try to, you don't make eye contact, and you look down, and you just hope that they don't stop too long. Nazareth. Okay, and, and Nazareth was uh, part of Galilee, all right, the, the region of Galilee, and, and all of Galilee, really, they, they, they were kind of the, they were the bumpkins, they were the hicks, they were the, the less regarded of society, and the interesting thing is, and this is just, this is free, because this happens in verse 1, and you don't find this out until verse 20, or in, until chapter 21 of this same book, Nathaniel was from Cana. Cana was also in Galilee. All right, so Nathaniel grew up, you know, in the bad parts of town. So he would have been familiar. He's like, look, I'm from Cana, and, you know, we, we played these guys in high school football every, every season. You know, it was the Cana-Nazareth uh, rivalry, and we burned couches, and we tore stuff up because, trust me, nothing good comes out of Nazareth. All right, so he had a, a very specific understanding. It wasn't that he was, he was from, uh, you know, Severna Park looking down on Nazareth. No, he was, he was, from, he was from over there, you know. Y'all can't believe I said that. <laughs> we know they do a little nicer over there. There's nothing to be ashamed of. Um, he wasn't from an affluent area looking down and saying, oh, can anything come out of Nazareth? No, Nathaniel was from Cana, which was in Galilee, next door to Nazareth. So these are just a couple of, couple of dudes from the sticks saying, look, I, I, I'm from there. Ain't nothing good coming out of there. So, so they'd been promised the Messiah. Here's the thing that's going to fulfill the promise. And Nathaniel says, no, <laughs> that's... that's I understand what you're saying. I understand that he, he checks off these boxes. But if he's from Nazareth, he ain't the Messiah. So Philip has a really good argument. Philip lays out the seven points of why Jesus being from Nazareth makes sense. Philip spends the next three hours convincing him, look, I understand that you don't think the Messiah may come from Nazareth, but here, here's a really good scholarly paper as to why, and I've brought in three rabbis, and we're going to sit you down and we're going to work through this. And those of you who are following along in your Bible kind of have a little smirk on your face because you know that's not what happened. Philip looks at Nathaniel and he says, come and see. <laughs> Just come check this out. Look, I, I know it doesn't make sense to you, and you know what? I can't convince you of it. Every objection you have about Nazareth is true. I've been there. I don't go there after dark. But look, you've got to come check this guy out. Come and see. Verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Now, your, your version may say deceit, or if you're reading from a, a, an older translation, it may, it may say guile, of whom there is no guile. All right, it's just a description, and I love this. You know, Jesus kind of peers into Nathaniel, and, and Jesus sees our heart. And he looks at Nathaniel and says, all right, <laughs> there's a straight shooter. There's a guy that I'm not going to be able to pull the wool over his eyes. There's a guy that's not going to pull any punches with me. There's a guy who's not just going to blow smoke and tell me what I want to hear. And there's a guy that if he's got issues, he's going to bring them up. And Nathaniel said to him, verse 48, how do you know me? So, so either by the way he described him, or maybe Jesus said, you know, hey, Nathaniel. Uh, but he says, how do you know me? And understand, this, we're not going we're to we're resolve this issue. We're just, we're just introducing this idea. But... Jesus answered, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. So Jesus reveals to Nathanael just a little 
a little piece of himself. And he immediately flips on a dime. He immediately goes from, look, nothing good comes out of Nazareth. I don't care who you say this guy is, to boom, you're the son of God. One verse. Jesus tells him a little something about himself. And he immediately goes from probably not the Messiah to, holy moly, it's the Messiah. It was just, it was just that quick. Philip, or Nathaniel doesn't bring up the Nazareth thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. You saw me under a fig tree, but where are you from again? Were, were you born there too? Because look, this Messiah thing doesn't make sense. Verse 50 says, Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus tells Nathaniel, he's like, look, you think that fig tree thing is cool? Just I, I knew you were sitting under a tree earlier. If you stick with me, you're going to see no less than 37 miracles that are recorded in the Gospel of John. And the first miracle, and this is just why I, just, I think the Bible is, is, is fascinating and I think Jesus is brilliant. Uh, the first miracle that we have recorded took place where? Anybody know? Cana. All right, where was Nathaniel from? Cana. You think I'm not the Messiah? Let's go see your folks. <laughs> I'm going to do something really cool, right? That's not exactly how it happened, but the first miracle happened in Nathaniel's hometown because this was a man that convinced, look, nothing, nothing good, nothing special, nothing God-honoring happens in my area. And Jesus says, watch this. You're going to experience the Son of Man in a way that few will. That's what he's telling you. You're going to see, and this is, this is kind of a throwback. If you read this language, uh, angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Uh, if you read the story, uh, do it when you get home. Uh, the story in Genesis about uh, Jacob's dream and Jacob's ladder. The same language is used. The angels descending and ascending. Um, but Jesus says, look, I know you've got objections. Let me tell you, we're, we're, going to get, we're getting ready to kick off a ministry here. Where there are going to be a lot of objections. And, and we're not going to be able to satisfy all, all, all of them. But if you'll cross that line with me, if you'll, if you'll follow me, if you'll go all in with me, you're going to see something so much more spectacular than that, that fig tree thing. But, but you've got you to gotta go all in. You, you can't hold anything back. And you know what? We have a pretty, pretty good detailed description of the conversations that Jesus had with his disciples. Nathaniel never brings up that Nazareth thing again. Because once you, once you start experiencing Jesus, once you start seeing a few folks get healed, a few folks raised from the dead, a few thousand folks healed, suddenly where somebody's from isn't particularly important. The Pharisees, when they were trying, as they oftentimes tried to do, to trick Jesus into saying the wrong thing or asking him a tricky question, they asked him what the most important commandment was. What's the most important thing that we need to do? And in Matthew chapter 22, he's actually quoting the Old Testament a passage of Deuteronomy. But Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And I believe there's some specificity to the levels and the order of those three levels. Heart, soul, mind. See, the, the tendency is to understand God with my mind. But Christianity, for most people, maybe if you are a Philip, follow me, okay. But Christianity, for most people, does not begin with having all of your questions answered. It just doesn't. Because God wants you to love him more than he wants you to understand him. But, once you love him, you begin to understand him. So there's three groups of people. Three groups of people. The next few weeks, we're, we're going to talk about uh, 
crossing these lines and look at, like I said, look at different people in Scripture that had objections, reasonable objections, and quite honestly, objections better than any I've heard from any of you. So what would it take for them to cross one of these lines? What would it take for you to cross one of these lines? You can't, you can't explain it away. You can't explain those objections away. All right, And you can read, read, read books and, you know... You, you, we have people that they, they met that one bad Christian that one time, that one hypocrite, you know, because, and it doesn't matter how many nice, good, normal, God-honoring Christians they meet after that, they just can't have anything to do, they can't go all in because that one person that one time. You can never explain these objections away, and, and you can never make them go away. But when you make it personal, they get smaller. They get insignificant because when Jesus starts to work in your life as he worked in the disciples' lives and as he can work in your life and in my life, some of those things don't become as important. So that's what we're going to look at for the next few weeks. We're going to look at making it personal. I would encourage each and every one of you. These are the things we love to talk about. We, We are not, I've said this before, we are not a place that fears questions. Jesus was not a man who feared questions. He looked at Nathaniel and said, hey, there's, there's, there's a straight shooter. There's a guy that's going to ask me some questions. These are the things we love to talk to you about. Do not, do not fear uh, reaching out to a pastor, reaching out to a deacon, saying, you know what, I've been parked in this spot for far too long, and here's the thing that keeps me from going over that line. We would love to talk to you about that. And you will still have objections when you leave. But we can talk to you about how to make it personal. Because when you make it personal, those objections get smaller. And that's what we're going to look at. I would encourage you, think about where you are. And think about what you're going to do to cross the line. Think about the people in your family, the people you work with, and where they are, what group they fall in. And how you can talk to them about crossing that line. We're going to make it personal. Let's pray.